He is the host of Heaters Gonna Hate um, as a podcast on the Off the Glass Podcast Network. We now welcome Kyle Russell onto Hoopsology. How's it going, Kyle? So far, so good today. I'm fully decked out in my heat gear. Figured if I'm going to be a guest, I should uh, dress accordingly. And also so that way, when I am about to be critical of the Miami Heat, you know it's coming from <laughs> a place of love. Well, love <laughs> we appreciate you being on the podcast, Kyle. So let's let's hop into it. And it must have been such a roller coaster ride for yourself, just in terms of this Miami Heat team, from you know going to the NBA Finals and then all of a sudden the season just started picking up in December. Um, I guess paint the overall view of heading into the season. So this. The bubble is over. The, you know the heat. You know whatever happened happened there. A great performance. What was your feeling coming into this season? Was there a lot of optimism? Was there kind of a lot of like kind of nervousness just due to the fact that the season was starting out so quickly and that teams were playing in their home arenas? What was kind of your mindset before kind of the season started? Gotcha. So uh, I guess like kind of the sum up of what happened last season. I mean, not to not to do the whole bubble fluke thing because sure. I don't think it was, but. I still walked away feeling that the Heat, um, you know, they over they overwhelmed. They did much better than beat expectations, things like that. So I tried to keep myself a little bit measured going into the second season um, of the Jimmy Butler era, just because I know it was a quick turnaround. Uh, we've seen in years past between Golden State, Miami Heat, Cleveland Cavaliers, you go, you have these short off seasons. It's tough to get right back to it, and this was the shortest ever. Um, but really, I don't know. I felt like the loss of Jay Crowder was tough. So there were some questions what we were going to do with the four. There were some questions what we were going to do with the guard. I still felt like we could have gotten a top four seed in the East pretty confidently. And I still think given if we had had full health, we would have. But I wasn't necessarily expecting us to, to go right back to the finals. Because uh, I knew Brooklyn, the Milwaukee Bucks made adjustments. I still expected, like, give me a second round maybe conference finals that's still a successful year so in saying that and seeing the results of this season and you you just mentioned off air just you know the heat i'm um, facing the bucks and how physically imposing Giannis is and just i guess how much that team had to prove you know in, in this matchup against the heat i mean how are you feeling about you know the team heading into the off season um just we'll hop into the different players on the team but overall picture um are you optimistic or, I mean, is this, it's just kind of a weird situation in terms of, you know, this year's performance in terms of the sweep and then last year, you know, with the bubble and, you know, making a huge run. What's, what's your overall opinions headed into kind of a normal off season and getting geared up for kind of things getting back to normal? Gotcha. Well, you, you say get back to normal, but I really don't think this is a team that wants to get back to normal. They don't want to get back to where they were right now because we just saw that that got swept. Sure. So um, I mentioned Jay Crowder earlier. While coming away from that Bucks series, one of the things that I really came to understand was how much we undervalued Jay Crowder and the importance that he did for Miami last year. He was a really good front court complement to Bam that could defend Giannis and still stretch the floor. Um, when we lost out on him, we spent a lot of time trying to figure that out this year, and then we tried to patch that with Trevor Ariza. That didn't work. So going into the off season, it is one of those things where. Um, when you get swept, you have holes in the roster. That spot at the four is one of the things that needs to be addressed. So, like, we need to bring somebody new, uh, so we're going to have change there. Um, I also think that we saw, and I really do dislike this because Goran Dragic has been one of my favorite key players, but he's taken a step back, and he's at the age and with some of the history, not quite sure if he can get back up to it. So we need to start looking at a backup spot for, like, a scoring guard as well. So going into this offseason, there are clear holes on the roster that need to be addressed. So under normal circumstances, you would probably paint that as maybe like a neutral to pessimistic. But one thing that is nice about rooting for Pat Riley and the Heat organization, they can make moves. So I'm optimistic the front office will make moves this summer. And then we just have to see what those moves are before how I feel going into next season. 
Yeah, the Heat have always been one of those teams, you know, because of Pat Riley, who you just mentioned. I mean, they're always in the mix, seemingly, for big free agents. There's been lots of buzz around Kawhi potentially going to the Knicks, or there's always been a little rumor about Kawhi to the Heat, like he would fit in great there. Um, but kind of adding on to that question and some of the things you mentioned, I mean, it's it sounds like you're pretty confident the Heat can continue with maybe like a couple patch-ups on the roster. In terms of the like big picture trajectory of this team, do you see as kind of the momentum being more like the window is staying open or the window is starting to close with, you know, Butler is another year older. He's certainly got some miles uh, on the tires, so to speak. You mentioned Dragic. Where, where do you think the Heat are in terms of that trajectory? on on their quest to win their next title gotcha okay that's a good one so if we're talking like overall trajectory then i would um given the state of the team as is right now i would say the trajectory is probably leaning more towards closing because you are right jimmy butler is getting older he plays a very physical style and so there are legitimate concerns especially given the problems he has with his jump shot um but he, Jimmy Butler does a lot of great things, but shooting is unfortunately his biggest weakness. As a Bulls fan, I'm sure you're a little aware. <laughs> um, but yeah, with with the looming decline for Butler, because Father Time is undefeated, that makes me think as things are right now, they're, they're trending down. The counter argument to that could be Bam Adebayo, because Adebayo continues to improve year over year. Even, even if it's only in small areas, he gets a mid-range jumper, he can do a free throw shot now. Um, he still continues to improve. So he could help push it back open and through that maybe recruit somebody as well because it, it is Miami. That's what they like to do, that they could pop it back open. But, yeah, currently I would say trending down. But we can always make some moves. Sure. Um, I got a question for you, Kyle. This, this popped into my mind. Just an overall kind of NBA question. Mm-hmm. Um, what has it been like for you just watching the NBA as a fan? Because we've, we've had a lot of journalists, and I've asked them this because they, they're covering the teams. But um, as for yourself, from the pandemic to um, now where you're starting to see fans back into the stands, are there anything that you've seen that was introduced during the pandemic era that, hey, you think that might want to stick around um, when the season comes back around in October or November, whenever the next season kicks off. That was introduced, like, versus, like, the video board um, with kind of the digital fans or anything else you saw from, like, a uh, coverage perspective. Um, Was there anything that kind of caught your eye that you might be down for it to to sticking around? Gotcha. So, uh, ah, shoot, I can't remember if they still do this now. I would need to. I'll, I'll check it on the. Well, I'm going to watch the Mass Clippers game and then I'll check then. Uh, the one thing I really remember from the bubble that I liked a lot was the amount of room they had around the court with all the Agreed. court seats gone. Just because you could see it in the play that the players were a lot more willing to take those hard drives to the rim because they know they don't have to land on a camera guy right underneath them. Um, you know, players just had a little bit of room, and I think it, it increased their safety. It let them play a lot looser and more freer, which is a better product. And I do, I do really hope that that continues on. Um, other things that I liked from just this was a little bit. Um, well, I don't want to get too much in the political side. I'll just say that I liked that they gave the players a voice to express their opinions. That's always a good thing. And the other thing that I really enjoyed was the playing game. I do, I understand that the teams that have their problems with it, I. I believe they're normally the teams that are in the playing game, but I think it is great because it really does. It gives a shot to those nine to 10 C teams that don't usually have something to play for, or maybe they just had a bad injury at the wrong time and that took them out of it. They have something to play for now versus the top six teams having something to play where they have like a little bit of extra break. Um, I think that is, that is good because then that can hopefully take down, you know, the whole load management thing as well. Yeah, agreed. I think there's a lot more excitement um, with the play-in tournament, um, especially with those lower-end teams, including the Chicago Bulls. I mean, in a normal circumstance, I'd be checked out and big. Well, I don't, don't care about them um, around you know March, April. But I was somewhat into it just due to the fact that they had some kind of a shot to play um, in that play-in tournament. So I, I do think that was overall um, a great thing. Um, wh- a question for me, and then I'll pass it to Matt. Um, I want to talk about Tyler Hero. Um, he, I think he is fascinating in the bubble um, and, and really caught my attention. And 
just watching the season unfold on Twitter, um, and we talked about this off air from different Heat journalists. It seems like they were constantly on his case, not only on his play off the court, excuse me, on his play on the court, but also just his off the court kind of personal life. So, you know, you watch this team very closely. Um, mm -hmm. Were the national news media and just kind of the reporters following his team, were they overreacting in terms of um, his? I guess, antics off the court in terms of his performance? Or do you think it was kind of like a normal sophomore slump? And it's kind of like, hey, this has been a weird just kind of two years in this guy's career. We should cut him some slack and really evaluate him in a full kind of NBA season. Yeah, good, good one. Um, so I guess like to first address the social media part and then sure. I'll get like more so into my assessment of it. So I, I do understand originally the people that have concerns about things like that because it is a lot of the whole – you see a young kid, he's got the Instagram girlfriend, he's out partying a lot. And I mean, like last year when he's doing that and hitting game winning shots, okay, cool. You kind of earned it when he's not producing this year, that, that tends to get more of the criticism. Um, overall, I tend to err on trusting the heat organization for this because I know that they are the kind of organization where, yeah, they will let you go party. They will let you go have your fun, but you get your work done first. So, like, we've had high-profile players. I've mentioned this before. Dwayne Wade, Jimmy Butler. These are players that you can you can find them on Instagram going to parties a lot. Well, maybe not so much Dwayne Wade. It wasn't that big at the time. But if it was, you would have seen him doing a lot of parties. And that's fine. Those players were superstars and put in the work to be ready at the highest level. Um, a counterexample to that is Justice Winslow, who was a player that, you know, his off-the-court interests weren't as publicized as Hero at all. And yet the Heat deemed that, no, you are not putting in um, enough work. And that's why eventually they moved on from him. So this team will, like, the spotlight isn't what determines whether or not the Heat view Hero as being too much into the social media or the fun side of it, the not working. It's how much work he puts in the gym. And so far, they're fine with him. So I'm going to trust that, that, that um, he's fine there. The other part of the question, though, like my assessment of Hero, it really seems like this was the kind of season, if I were to be generous, I would just say this is a season he hit the rookie wall because really he didn't get it that much last year because we stopped in March. Um, and then he came back, had five months of rest, played great in the playoffs, quick turnaround. So I am concerned because he, he hit that wall hard. And we saw it a lot in the Buck series. Like um, on he, the Heat is going to heat, one of my X factors was, can Miami get one of three guards to do something in a game between Dragic, Nunn, and Hero? And Hero ended up being the worst of the three in pretty much every game. Um, but he's got a full offseason. He's still got the backing of the organization. Even Pat Riley yesterday was still calling him a core player. So i got to continue to put my faith in the organization and see what he looks like in the offseason. Though I do think next year might be a make or break year in terms of like how long he's a Heat player. Yeah, it was kind of staggering that, you know, as I, I don't need to tell you, but for the listeners, you know, he was considered uh, like the foundational trade piece in a potential deal for James Harden. And then, you know, that value kind of plummeted with that sophomore slump that you sort of mentioned. In terms of, you know, I, I only caught glimpses of Tyler Hero this year, so I, I really can't comment on where his game is gone, if if teams just kind of figured him out, having more tape on him, or schemes just changed, things like that. Do you see, do you think he has potential for growth in his abilities? And and where do you think that needs to come from? Is it like more accurate shooting? Or what what do you think um, he needs to grow in this offseason as he trains for next season? So I mean, you can always get better at shooting. And that was really one of the things that he he regressed this year most definitely was in shooting. Um, he just couldn't – maybe it was legs. So, like, for, for example, he had, I want to say, about a two-week break for, like, an ankle injury near April. And when he came back, he was phenomenal for about a week or two. And then it regressed the last two games of the season and it went into what we saw in the playoffs. So I do wonder if fatigue is a general problem. Um, he is definitely slight of frame. So one of the things that he would really need to add in this off season would be getting in the gym and really working out. You can't do that if the, in the last year because you only had two months off um, and you can't do that during the season. So that'll be an interesting area. Um, 
yeah, get the shooting back because that's that's kind of the foundation of his game. But he has still improved this year in other areas, especially like pick and roll handling and finishing at the rim. Um, so those are things I think he can continue to build on. And then just, yeah, get get more physical so you can be better on defense and better conditioned and get back in the gym to try to get that shot back. Like, I don't think there's a ton that needs to be added for him to get back to what he was in the bubble last year. Yeah, no, another, um, you know, big roster addition uh, that he did end up getting some trade pieces from the Rockets in, in Victor Oladipo specifically. Uh, what do you see as his future with the team? Uh, remind me if, if you know off the top of uh, your head what, what his contract is. Will he be there next year? And do you see him sticking around as a piece on the Heat? So that I think is very much determined by the market. Uh, what I mean by that is, he is, an unre- he is an unrestricted free agent this offseason. Um, he just had surgery that could theoretically keep him out most, if not all, of the regular season next year. Really, I think it comes down to if anybody wants to throw money at him um, for, for like the way the Heat see it. Like The, the Heat, I, I appreciated that they gave him a shot, and they were actually very, very nice in letting him go get other opinions. Um, We've we've seen that at time like with Chris Bosch, for example. They were they were very nice to him and letting him go and seek other opinions and stuff before eventually, unfortunately, having to retire. Um, but with the, the Oladipo, they've done a good job of kind of keeping in touch with him, letting him know like, hey, give us updates. But the big the first big thing is going to be what happens this off season. Somebody comes up and says, hey, we don't care if you're going to be benched most of next year. We want you in year two or three after. Here's a chunk of money. Miami's probably going to say, congratulations, good for you, dude, go get your money. So I I really don't know what to say about Oladipo until after this offseason. I do still think the Heat, in a worst-case scenario, if he doesn't get anything, they probably float him a small, maybe maybe mid-level, although I doubt it. They probably want to use that for something else. Maybe it would just be that men. But I think they would make a spot on the roster for him at worst case. Yeah, I was just going to say he could, he could be a candidate for like what the Warriors did with DeMarcus Cousins a, a couple mm-hmm. years ago. You know, give that veteran minimum and see if he can rehab and be there in the playoffs. Yeah, I, I think um, that's interesting. Uh, another uh, player that that I just wanted to get your thoughts on in in how he developed this year was Duncan Robinson. I mean, I mean, I think it almost. Um, maybe not quite to this extreme. It's it's not the the greatest analogy, but almost kind of the inverse of Tyler Hero. I mean, he Duncan Robinson certainly had moments in that um, run to the finals, no doubt. But it seemed like his value just continued uh, to scale up this season. What did you see from him this year? And do you think he's he's a major priority this off season for the Heat or moving forward? Yeah, absolutely a major priority this off season. So. Uh, but personally, my thoughts on what's what the Heat should do looking going into this offseason is Bam Butler, maybe Robinson, depending upon like if somebody just throw if somebody throws the whole Brinks truck at him. Cool, go get your money, dude. Um, he's he's restricted free agent this offseason, yes, right? Yes, okay, he's restricted exactly. Um, and then try to keep Hero. But if a really good trade package comes, then maybe move on from that. But after what Riley said yesterday, maybe not. Uh, but to go back to Robinson, um, his – so one thing we got to remember, like last year, the first year of the Robinson thing was an abnormally, insanely good shooting season by pretty much any standard you have. Uh, for me personally, it was really weird because I first saw Drunken Robinson play the year before the 2018-19 um, season with Jimmy with, – right before Jimmy Butler came, and I couldn't stand it. He bricked everything. <laughs> it was, it was, I was like, why is this guy playing? He's shooting 20% on like 10 attempts a game. I don't get it. <laughs> and then the next year they started putting him in there. I'm like, no, why are you doing this? And then you just completely proved me wrong. So awesome to Robinson. But um, yeah, this year where Robinson, I was really impressed with was one, he was able to sustain at that level. Like he, like again, from an all-time great season to just having a great season, it's still really good. Like, sure, it's a step down, but it's still one of the best shooters in the league. Um, I was more impressed in growth he did in other areas, specifically on defense, because we saw, especially after the playoff run, where he got targeted a lot, 
he improved a lot as a defender because of that. And then the other thing was he flashed some ability to throw the ball on the floor, drive in a little bit, do a little, like just try to be more than just a shooter. So that way, if they're closing out hard, you can, you can make them punish with that other ways. So I still think Duncan has room to grow. I do think he's kind of capped as kind of a Joe Harris, Joe Harris, Harris type role player where like fourth, fourth, like on a really good team, third, fourth option. But nonetheless, um, I do still think he's a priority to keep this off season because if he, he was their sole source of shooting really this season Mm -hmm. Um, to your point, that's why his value seems so much higher because last season we had multiple 40, 40 percent plus shooters this year, we really only had Duncan Robinson, so that made it that much more important. But I think that he tried to keep him unless somebody throws a ton of money at him. Um, and I think he can he still has room to grow as well, especially with a full offseason. Kyle, I wanted to ask you about Bam and Abayo. Um, I, don't, I, wouldn't, I guess I would stretch to call him like an enigma kind of in the league just because of – I don't know the criticism that he gets, but yeah, I think he, in, my, in my opinion, I think he can be an elite player in this league. I mean, he, just by the improvement that he's shown from your assessment, wh- where does he fit on this Miami heat team? Is he a crowning piece where you can surround players to compliment him? Or do you think you need to like go out and get another superstar and it could be the other way around where bam and a bio can be that second or third kind of option overall. Gotcha. Uh, so currently, I would say that Bam is the second best player on the team behind Butler. I don't think that's there's too much controversy there. No. Um, I think it's more so the the long term that that is the question. And so for that, it it we don't know it at the moment. Um, like I mentioned earlier, Bam he still continues to add things to his game every year. So we think like he kind of came in with the defense ready. He started to work on the playmaking. He developed himself a role on the floor. Uh, last year he was more of like a really good playmaker, shaky scorer. This year he added a mid-range jumper um, and a free throw shot, free throw shot. So he hit like in the 80s. That's good. He flashed some ability to get to the rim. So overall he's still trending up. And it's the question of given his age, how many more levels can he keep going? So example, if he if he tops out, say like this is where he's at right now then he's the second best player on a title team, which is still a very good thing. But at that point, you need to go out and, and get your star. Um, the, I know the Miami Heat, their nickname for him is no ceiling because they legitimately believe he has no ceiling on his game. And given the growth he's had so far, I can I can see why they put the faith in that. So if he gets a really good jumper, if he can get that out to three, then yeah, he's he's – your number one player in our title team. He can be in the MVP conversation because he has the defense. He already has the playmaking really just needs the the shot. Um, And then he's an all around player at that point. Um, Kyle, I I wanted to ask you more of a general NBA question um, just regarding what do you think the league has um, presented to you in terms of entertainment value? I've just heard some criticism from, I think, Charles Barkley in terms of the players, a lot of players getting hurt, and just in terms of this season, how it's been implemented, implemented, excuse me, in terms of, you know, just varying variables in terms of the all-star break and then in terms of the season starting in December, what's been your overall just opinion of this, how entertaining this season has, do you think um, this has presented, have you been satisfied overall with what you've seen on the court from an entertainment perspective, or do you think the NBA kind of missed the boat in terms of, can I start in the, the season off in December? And it's kind of, you know, I guess, um, lack of a better term, just ricocheted and just um, kind of gone downhill in terms of just the, the injuries we've seen. Um, I, we've had an injury expert saying like this season really hasn't been too much different than other seasons in terms of injuries. But yeah, I, I've heard a lot of criticism just in terms of the, kind of the shortened season um, just in, in regards of how the NBA has handled it. What's, what's been your opinion so far? Gotcha. Um, quick question with that expert. What, what kind of like data were they doing? Were they saying like the total number of injuries have been about the same between the seasons? Um, I, I believe so. He said that I believe we interviewed him in the month of April. That was mm-hmm. like a higher than normal percentage, but 
nothing like astronomically high. That was right at the point where there's like max criticism in terms of the players getting hurt. I think LeBron got hurt. I think what's his? It, it was, was uh, right, right after right. Jamal Murray got there. Hurt. You go. Yeah. Yeah. So I think with that, um, so the reason why I asked that question is because like you think about it, we had a short and condensed season and if it's the same number of injuries as another season that's longer then like essentially all those injuries are being compressed, sure. which, may, which thus heightens our perception of it as well. I think really what, if you want to look at, at injuries this season, you look at the teams that played a lot like late into last season. So look at the four conference finals teams, right? Denver Nuggets, Jamal Murray, um, LeBron, sorry, Lakers, LeBron and AD, Miami Heat, Jimmy Butler, and all of them at the beginning of the season, and then uh, Boston Celtics, Jalen Brown, Kim Walker. So you look at those four conference teams, none of them got away with a major injury this season versus other teams like, say, like, like the Suns, for example. They're a very young team that didn't play. They were in the bubble, sure, but they weren't in the playoffs. Relatively healthy year. Yeah. So um, – in terms of the on the court product, I'm, I'm I'm still satisfied. I'm I'm still decked out in Miami gear. <laughs> I am in, admittedly biased, uh, so I can I can understand overall some people maybe having problems with the way the NBA did this season. I can see the counter argument that it that it is a business. They had certain commitments that needed to be made, and at the end of the day, this is stuff that they still negotiated with the players. So I feel better about that. Um, then, then it, obviously if it was just them telling them to, uh, I think it's just kind of like a bad thing that had to happen, especially after the NFL, after the NFL had their season, the NBA didn't really have any excuse. They had to go through with it. Um, they compromised 72 games play in, but I don't know. They kind of got stuck between a rock and a hard place. In my opinion, I'm so satisfied. I'm still watching. My team's knocked out, and I'm still going to be watching Mavs Clippers tonight and the rest of the playoffs just because I love the NBA. Um, and I think that anybody that's still in that boat like me, yeah, there's a lot of off-the-camera stuff to, to kind of chew and talk about and was this right or wrong. But once once the ball starts bouncing, I, I'm enjoy, I've enjoyed the product. Kyle, I have to ask you your thoughts on um, Udonis Haslam and his amazing minutes against the 76ers. Uh, I, didn't. <laughs> I, I love Udonis Haslam. Um, been a huge fan of his always. Uh, what, what did you think about that altercation? And then also, have you heard anything about, um, is he returning to the team next year? Is he sliding into a coaching role or front office role? Has there been any word on that yet? So, but first off, the altercation. Um, I would say when Udonis Haslam gets his statue outside of the arena, it should literally just be <laughs> him just doing the. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that is everything that UD is. Um, in regards to, uh, obviously he, he has meant a ton for the team. He has more or less been an in the locker room coach, obviously more so than a player now. I mean, he's still listed as the team leader. Uh, even uh, was a game, I think it was game. It was near the end of game four that there was um, a, a scene of him like still throwing the chair. He was so ticked off because yeah. they had that lead in the third. He still cares, and he still has a voice in that locker room, even if – I mean, even if it's the end of game four and you can see that they're checked out. They're still here listening to it. So his future with the Heat really is in his hands. The Heat will keep a roster spot open for him for as long as he wants. I mean, that's that's pretty much been out there for a while. Um, if he wants to transition to a coaching job, he will. I don't know exactly what he wants to do. Uh, he, I think he pretty much says at this point he kind of takes it year by year. But, yeah, whenever UD is ready to retire, thank you for everything. If he wants to stay, we got a spot. Um, and then that, that's his decision to make. Yeah, it's probably between uh, – it's probably like – Tim Tebow and then Udonis Haslam as most beloved Floridian athletes, you know, with, with him playing college ball at university of Florida, as you know, uh, or maybe they're tied at this point since he's spent his whole career there in Miami. Um, I just had a personal curiosity, you know, now that the heat are out, what are you personally rooting for in the Eastern conference and beyond? Are you kind of rooting against all the other Eastern conference teams or how would you like to see the rest of the playoffs unfold? Sure. So originally, I I was actually um, I, don't, I don't know if I'll get hurt for this, but I was going to root for the Lakers. 
I have a vested interest in LeBron getting as many championships as possible. So then I can say that the Heat taught him how to how taught the goat how to win championships. <laughs> there we go. Uh, regardless, um, yeah, but the Lakers being bounced though, I actually am leaning more towards the Bucks as counterintuitive that that might be because one, I think they were actually like seeing them up close. They were a legitimately impressive team on both ends of the floor. Uh, even though they, they kind of like ripped my soul out. It's kind of like, oh, wow, I'm impressed at the way that you're just tearing at the little bits of my team. <laughs> <laughs> but the other part of that is um, if we get beat, I want to get beat by the champs. So uh, I want, I'm willing for the Bucks at this point going forward. Sure. Do you think the uh, Nets are the title favorites at this point with the Lakers being gone? They have to be. They really do. Because the, the questions about the Nets have more so to do with, like, how much time that they've gotten on the floor together. Will they be able to gel? Will they be able to do enough defense? And really, I think you just look at that offensive power, offensive power of those three, plus Joe Harris, and then whoever else they want to kind of throw out there. Um, and it's just so great that they have to be the betting favorites. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, just so, so much loaded with talent. Um, and I think it's going to be very interesting. There's a lot of combustible elements. So um, I can also see them kind of imploding. So we'll have to wait and see. But so far, they remain healthy. I mean, we've seen even with Philadelphia, with Embiid, I mean, with them, um, Terry's experiencing, it, it's, it's looking like Brooklyn's going to kind of be the front runners, um, them or, you know, uh, Milwaukee, kind of those, those two in. In the, in the running there. Um, Kyle, thank you very much for joining the show. Um, please let our listeners and viewers know where they can find you on social media, where they can find your podcast, anything else you're working on for the rest of this year as well. Appreciate it. So you can find me on Twitter at KBR Heat Nation. And you can also find the, the podcast for Heaters Gonna Heat at Heaters Heating. And then you can find Heaters Gonna Heat itself on pretty much most of your major platforms. We, we go through Anchor. So Spotify, uh, iTunes. I don't know much after that, but if it's distributed by Anchor, I gotcha. And I'll still be producing some content throughout the summer. And then, of course, once the season gets back up and going, we're we'll going full blast again. Awesome, Kyle. Uh, thanks very much for joining the show. Appreciate your perspective on the heat. Thank you very much for having me. I had a lot of fun. Thanks, Kyle.